Hi, I am Richard Pountney, and I'm a Principal Lecturer in Curriculum Development in the Sheffield Institute of Education at Sheffield Hallam University. I'm also co-convener of the Bureau Curriculum Assessment and Pedagogy Special Interest Group. Today, I'm going to talk about the work that people, that teachers do when they plan, design, and make the curriculum, and how they think about and understand it. I will start by discussing how teachers produce the curriculum, and then I will look at the role of teacher as curriculum maker and how it applies in schools. This will lead me to the conditions for teachers to become curriculum thinkers in order that they can refresh and, if necessary, reform the curriculum. And finally, I will explore the place of curriculum studies in teacher education in all phases to underpin teachers' participation in and engagement with the curriculum. I want to start with some observations on this being a time for the curriculum. First, there is, I think, a, a re-emergence in curriculum thinking about the purpose of education. Second, there is a concurrent shift in what we understand as the quality of the curriculum in which teachers have an important part to play as curriculum makers. This is evidence in the new school's inspection framework and the emphasis on the importance of children developing a deep body of knowledge. So how do teachers produce the curriculum and to what extent does the mandated curriculum promote or hinder teachers' participation in this? In this first section, I want to discuss the role teachers have in producing the curriculum. The day-to-day -day work that teachers do is mainly in delivering the curriculum that is made by others, particularly early in a teacher's career. Syllabuses are followed and national curriculum adhered to, and this is the default position for most teachers. Given the time pressures of busy schools, timetables, and classrooms, it's perhaps not surprising that teachers' repertoires of curriculum production are limited to schemes of work and lesson plans. But we need to know more about these practices and how teachers enact the curriculum what this entails when it takes place. One meta framework of curriculum making based on extensive empirical studies of curriculum decision making in the US stipulates three interrelated arenas. The first is the, the policy curriculum or the abstract or, or ideal curriculum, which defines the connection between schooling and policy. The second is the program curriculum which translates curriculum policy into instruments that are used in actual curriculum events. And then the classroom curricul curriculum made up of these curriculum events, jointly developed by teachers and students to achieve, to achieve instructional goals. In this framework, curriculum is seen as an enactment of policy. Basil Bernstein suggests that this is an example of what he refers to as the totally pedagogized society where learning, and to that matter teaching, is constituted as a performance rather than a competence, and which, in which teachers are trainable generically. Bernstein uses a conceptual tool called the pedagogic device, and he argues that the discourse of the curriculum is governed by rules that operate in how curriculum knowledge is produced, recontextualized, and reproduced. I will return to this underpinning idea later in my talk, with regard to the pedagogic imperative and how this influences teachers' curriculum work. The first statutory national curriculum for England and Wales was introduced by the Education Reform Act in 1988. Welcomed by teachers initially as the inclusive means to, deliver, to develop the curriculum, it has become perceived as state control over content matter to be taught and associated reduction of teachers' agency in deciding what their pupils need. The connection between curriculum standards and inspection of schools in curriculum quality by the Office of Standards in Education followed. Ofsted published its new inspection framework for England in May 2019. In this, Ofsted claims not to prescribe a curriculum. And indeed, in her 2018 Festival of Education speech, Amanda, Amanda Spielman, Ofsted Chief Inspector, called on schools to be bold and ambitious in designing the curriculum. Ofsted, however, do offer a definition for the term curriculum. 
as a framework that sets out the aims of a program of education and how that framework is translated over time into a structure and narrative. And finally, how the knowledge and understanding pupils have gained is evaluated. Ofsted maps these ideas against the key words, intent, implementation, and impact that inspectors have been asked to explore when evaluating the quality of schools curriculum. Intent is examined in how uniquely curriculum design is related to the local context of the school and students' needs, and where a consensus on the curriculum approach and subscription to its principles exists. This underlying tenet is that high quality curricula is linked, are linked directly to the degree of coherence in the design and delivery of the school's curriculum. But this idea is, is contested to an extent. And the words of Lawrence Stenhouse stand as a stark contrast to the view of a mandated curriculum. He says, a curriculum like the recipe for a dish is first imagined as a possibility and then the subject of experiment. The recipe offered publicly is it is, in a sense, a report on the experiment. Similarly, a curriculum should be grounded in practice. It is an attempt to describe the work observed in classrooms, that it is adequately communicated to teachers and others. Finally, within limits, a recipe can vary according to taste. So can a curriculum. The idea of the curriculum as process rather than product resonates with Stenhouse's ideas on the curriculum, which he says is a function of knowledge that does not determine behavior, but liberates it. Teachers might also take heart from the statement that Ofsted inspectors will judge schools that take radically different approaches to the curriculum fairly. They will assess a school's fa curriculum favorably when leaders have built a curriculum with appropriate coverage, content structure and sequencing and implemented it effectively. Thus, in this sense, curriculum is a particular form of specification about the practice of teaching. It is not just a package of materials or a syllabus of ground to be covered. In Stenhouse's words, it is a way of translating any educational idea into a hypothesis testable in practice. It invites critical testing rather than acceptance. The question therefore is how can teachers work within this to create a curriculum that complies with an accountability culture while testing the boundaries of what is possible. Is curriculum innovation possible and under what circumstances? I want now to consider how teachers enact the curriculum. I will look briefly at the components of the curriculum and how teachers learn to do this and what promotes and what hinders this work. While we know relatively little about teachers' curriculum making practices, what they entail, when and how they take place, etc., we might characterize this as a form of curriculum reproduction and teachers as reproducers. Teachers' main concern is with the delivery of the curriculum, the day job, as they might see it. This involves interpreting national curricula, developing schemes of work, and making sets of or individual lesson plans. And this is, is essentially an individual task based on a repertoire that the teacher builds up over time. The teacher's access to the pool of repertoires in the community, the, correct, the collective reservoir is important here. The main activity in curriculum preparation is the selection, sequencing and pacing of subject content knowledge into forms suitable for teaching, such as schemes of work, topic plans and individual lesson plans. This involves two distinct types of subject knowledge structure. The first is the essential concepts, principles, and frameworks that subject specialists use to see and explore the world, known as the substantive structure of the subject. And the specific ways of investigating the world, the kinds of evidence and the ways of proof that are used by subject specialists to know about the world, is referred to as the syntactic structure of the subject. At all phases, pupils can be introduced and inducted into these ways of being and knowing the world from the subject's point of view. This includes learning the specific, sometimes technical language of the subject and applying this language when solving problems or learning new and more complex things. A US report shows that teachers spend se between seven and 12 hours per week 
searching for and modifying materials. Teachers often equate the materials or artifacts that they use to content. These material realizations of curriculum work as curriculum objects, if you like, are not all made by the teachers themselves. They are representative of the meanings that teachers give to them. We might say that they construe meaning, and of course, they are freighted with the teacher's concerns for children's learning. Traditionally, especially in secondary education, teachers have used course textbooks authored by subject specialist experts, often other teachers. Increasingly though, teachers are becoming reliant on materials created by third parties, including free resource banks of teaching materials, and more recently, by paid for subscription to academic publishers. This positions teachers as consumers, as well as producers of education material that they can accommodate into their work. The quality control and coherence of these materials can vary. And this leads to the argument that this is better left to, to authorized producers of educational content. National schemes are being commissioned for core subjects to be provided as oven ready to schools. And behind this, is the Department for Education report on curriculum support resources in schools in 2018, suggesting that teachers commonly adapt resources to tailor content, particularly for pupils with special educational needs or English as an additional language. But less commonly, they tailor resources to provide challenge for higher ability pupils, especially at secondary level. While reducing the workload of busy teachers, there are negative outcomes in the outsourcing of the oven ready curriculum, including the lack of local context, which is important for student engagement. It might also be seen as a cynical political move to build the case for subject specialism in order that outsourcing of the curriculum can take place and where the capacity and competence of teachers to deliver the curriculum is called into question. When teachers train to be teachers, they are introduced to the mandated curriculum. The debate about what this induction to the curriculum should contain and cover is often framed by arguments about what future skills and knowledge children need, the notions of lifelong learning and 21st century skills. Biester argues that this is learnification in, in which the what of learning has become invisible. The argument is, that good teachers are adaptive ones, suggesting an expectation that good teachers can knock up a good curriculum on the hoof. It assumes that teachers know the curriculum well enough to have fluency in it and to be able to exercise judgment in what is appropriate and what works and have the basic skills to select sequence and pace. However, these basics are not easily acquired. For example, knowing how long to spend on a curriculum topic and critically when to move on is an essential pacing skill developed over time. Left to chance, these sequencing and pacing skills become predominantly in the moment pedagogical decisions. They are focused on delivery and what I have to teach the next day. Our research in New Zealand and England schools show this activity to lie between pragmatic and principled and that where teachers position themselves on this continuum has implications for the coherence of the curriculum. Teachers also feel they have little control over the curriculum, and this contributes to a low sense of job satisfaction with effects on teacher retention. The conception of teacher as a reproducing rather than as a recontextualizing curriculum agent promotes an uncritical acceptance of the prescribed curriculum. Moray reminds us that for teachers to feel able and ready to be involved in curriculum development, they require the recognition rules in order to know what a good curriculum looks like, and the realization rules for bringing the curriculum into existence. If teachers do not have these understandings, their curriculum making is much more likely to be expedient. We know that professional development is claimed to be more effective when it involves training in subject knowledge rather than general pedagogical techniques that are divorced from the content and context of learning. The impact on teachers' classroom practice is greater when both training on subject knowledge and pedagogical techniques are delivered together. It is also important for teachers to check their own understanding of what works 
and to not take at face value their own allegiance to a particular method of teaching. It also helps when teachers' explicit attention in the classroom is guided towards the specialized language and system of meanings that surround subject content. The Education Endowment Fund report highlights the three tiers of vocabulary, and in particular, tier three low frequency words that are domain specific and are most likely learned in a, con a subject context. For example, the concept of mass in science. The importance of teachers' subject knowledge is recognized in England in the Department for Education's Early Career Framework, introduced to provide a professional development program for early career teachers. This provides an entitlement to, to a two-year program of professional development mapped to the teacher standards, designed to help early career teachers to develop their practice knowledge and working habits. While the framework claims to be research evidence-based, when I search for curriculum development in the EEF's evaluation toolkit, toolkit, it throws up 29 results, many of which have little to do with the design and planning of curriculum and curriculum content, but rather on the delivery and pedagogy of it. This is at odds with the substantive aspect of standard three. A closer look at the, the career framework section three, subject and curriculum, linked to teacher standard three, which is demonstrate good subject and curriculum knowledge, shows how this is set out as a learn that and learn how to statements. And I've highlighted two here that I feel are indicative of an emphasis on, a particular emphasis on curriculum. And the first highlighted is the learn that statement that secure subject knowledge helps teachers to motivate pupils and teach effectively. The second highlighted is a learn how to statement that to deliver a carefully sequenced and coherent curriculum, teachers should ensure pupils' thinking is focused on key ideas within the subject. I've highlighted two further statements here. The teachers should learn that carefully sequencing teaching is important if pupils are to learn new ideas by linking those ideas to existing knowledge and to organize this knowledge into increasingly complex mental models and the teacher should learn how to help pupils apply knowledge and skills to other contexts by ensuring they have relevant domain specific knowledge especially when being asked to think critically on a subject note the acknowledgement here that critical thinking may be specific within a subject these examples i feel illustrate the importance given to these ideas in teachers early careers the kinds of questions that the early career framework asks early career teachers is shown, is, is shown in an example on this slide. And it's indicative of how subject knowledge is viewed and understood. The first question is intended to prompt early career teachers to articulate their understanding of how subject knowledge is developed over time and techniques they have used, such as sequencing of content and assessing understanding. And the second, the key point to be made is that all subjects are structured by key ideas, concepts or collection of ideas, including specific subject skills that shape how the subject is understood and developed. And this is important at all phases of schooling. Notable in the final question in the task is the emphasis on ensuring pupils have relevant domain specific knowledge, especially when being asked to think critically within a subject. It's worth noting the intended sequence in these three questions and how teachers' responses to these can be short-circuited by the need for expediency in busy classrooms. So what has prompted this focus on subject knowledge in teacher education? Subject knowledge and high-quality teaching are, main, are the main themes of the independent review of the primary curriculum in 2009. Ofsted subject reports have shown the considerable demands on, sub on teachers' subject knowledge across the primary curriculum, not least in requiring them to understand how pupils learn in different subjects. Notably, the role of the subject leader was too limited a role and teachers had too, li too little support to carry it out effectively. However, note the observation that strong general teaching skills more than made up for any weakness in their weaknesses in their knowledge of the subject they were teaching. Even allowing for the 
recognition in the report that this leads to a failure to tackle specific subject errors and misconceptions. This appears a fudge. The new school inspection framework is less likely to overlook these weaknesses in, and it has raised the profile of leading subject, of leading subject leadership, uh, leading the subject in schools. Good subject knowledge is advocated by those academics and practitioners advising on the early career framework. And this includes revisiting the big ideas of the subject over time in a spiral that deepens learning, requiring teachers to know the structure of the subject well enough to know how pupils' fluency in subject knowledge and skills develops. Again, the idea of the, of the adaptive teacher arises, one who secures subject knowledge can help pupils to build increasingly complex mental models. I want to return to the idea of teachers as quick on thinkers, how pedagogy dom dominates this thinking and the part played by curriculum subjects, curriculum knowledge and curriculum leadership. It's not surprising that when planning schemes of work and lesson plans, teachers are concerned with how they will teach, including how to motivate and engage pupils. However, the degree to which the teacher can individualize a lesson is limited, leading to a tendency towards generic learning focused activities. Topic planning and systematic attention by the teacher to the topic's proposition tends therefore to be circumspect, leading to weaker coherence between the concepts and content. Elizabeth Rata's curriculum design coherence model seeks to address this. While this pedagogical imperative is imperative is ever present. I feel this is more than the attention seeking naughty child of the classroom. I am saying that the demands of teaching dominate the here and now, or at least restrict foresight in planning to the near future, rather than the fact that teachers might lack concentration on curriculum and its structure. I also would like to acknowledge an alternative view that teachers are exerting their autonomy when they focus primarily on how they teach over what they teach. And this is a, is a sphere of practice that they have the most influence over. However, it remains that teacher decision-making at this classroom level increases the attention on pedagogy. An overriding concern for what the teacher has to teach tomorrow morning as the pedagogic imperative. Noticeable here then is the notion of pedagogy as proxy for curriculum. As Dylan Williams articulates, a bad curriculum well taught is invariably a better experience for students than a good curriculum badly taught. Pedagogy trumps curriculum, or more precisely, pedagogy is curriculum, is curriculum because what matters is how things are taught rather than what is taught. One tendency arising from the pedagogic imperative is to conflate curriculum and pedagogy and to neglect the differences between them. It can also result in what Maton refers to as a form of knowledge blindness. This disregard is exacerbated by the current pluralism in pedagogy, that all flavors of pedagogy are okay, as long as learning is taking place. There is a swing back against this arising from the EEF evaluation tools that discredit some of the more arcane pedagogies and pedagogical strategies while also promoting an outcomes-based focus over teachers' decision-making, leading to an instrumental process. Brian Simon in 1981 wrote an article arguing that English education had failed to develop a science of learning and that the time was ripe for the development of such a science. Little in 2020 revisited this argument, suggesting this is still true and that in place of genuine pedagogical positions, unresolved dichotomies between progressive and traditional, between child-centered and subject-centered, or more generally between informal and formal approaches. Their argument is that instead of these binary positions, we need a, a science of pedagogy to fully understand the complexities of classroom practice. The pedagogical imperative, however, is a pragmatic response rather than a principled one. It has a particular impact on teachers' capacity and willingness to engage in curriculum making, especially in curriculum subjects where the structure of conceptual knowledge is less clearly defined. 
the Esther's notion of learnification one, once again comes to mind. Where, in other words, education is seen only as an issue of learning made accessible only through the language of learning, a language that, that is inadequate in its capacity to deal with curricular questions. For this, we need the scholarship and language of the curriculum. So here are the key ideas of a discipline provide access to the curriculum by making the connection between knowledge and abstract thought. When we plan a curriculum, we are designing experiences for young people to have, and it can have a profound effect on how children see and understand the world. The curriculum, therefore, can become the gateway to new contexts and understandings, and as such is a form of social justice, or indeed epistemic justice. Through the curriculum, young people can access not just how the world can be different, but how their place in the world can be different. And this is what Michael Young refers to as powerful knowledge. But note also on the use of curriculum and knowledge maps. The example I have here is from the Education Endowment Fund. There are, these are somewhat discredited owing perhaps to their overuse as shortcuts to planning the curriculum, but they can help the teacher to codify the curriculum in order to manage the level of complexity that a knowledge approach to the curriculum brings. This can be realized visually as knowledge organizers, such as the one here. The popularity of these owes something to the way this reduces complexity and provides a holistic overview to a curriculum topic, including the specialist vocabulary a topic involves. Again, the pedagogic imperative hinders this representation by reducing it to an impression only of the curriculum. Approaches that map the curriculum enable teachers to know the content of their subject more intimately. Elizabeth Rata argues that curriculum making requires this so that teachers can select content while also judging their own performance in doing so. Subjects in her terms provide the coherence and subject content offers the coherence mechanism. Here I am, I'm making the case for subject and disciplinary knowledge as key to teachers' curriculum development because it is the raw material for curriculum making. If we want teachers to become more expert at making the curriculum, they need a strong conception of knowledge and to be prepared to lead on it. Curriculum leadership in schools is often associated with middle leaders as in history coordinator or head of science. While linked to subjects, the emphasis is on management rather than the idea of subject curation. Nurturing subject knowledge and its integrity is key to helping learners to develop their own subject knowledge. Teachers often have to research and deepen their own knowledge as a trial and an error process that runs the risk of missing students' misconceptions. While teachers and, as learners is, a, is an important principle in any school, this is, speci is especially challenged in induction, especially of newly or recently qualified colleagues. Take, for example, an activity with subject leaders based on Ofsted's new schools inspection framework and, the, and its considerations. The following questions are based on Christine Council's work on subject leadership. She poses the task of choosing a topic within your subject and addressing a set of questions that can, that can be used to lead the topic's development. The questions are grouped under the school's inspection framework areas, curriculum intent, curriculum implementation and curriculum impact, and I've highlighted several to, exempl to exemplify the process. For curriculum intent, the question of what big ideas, wider trends, general principles is the subject topic part of, and when will subjects revisit the subject topic in the future? In terms of curriculum implementation, what blend of teaching approaches do you expect to see if students are to gain mastery of the topic and which students will struggle? To encourage the consideration of the impact of the topic on the pupils' learning, the questions asked are how confident is the teacher that students remember what they've learned about the subject topic and importantly, what does high quality work or problem solving look like? These questions I feel begin to codify curriculum leadership knowledge for teachers, but they can also be used by senior leaders to lead the curriculum. They constitute Bernstein's recognition rules I mentioned earlier, and they make possible the identification of the realization rules. The concern for, for senior leaders 
is whether subject leaders in the school have achieved internal coherence, coherence for their subjects. And then to see this across subjects and across phases, year groups, and across the whole school for external coherence to the outside world and, and to society. In this final section, I'm going to bring together arguments I've made earlier in this presentation in order to make the, the case for curriculum studies in teacher education. I'm going to start with curriculum thinking and, uh, and, theor and theorizing. Deng argues that contemporary curriculum theorizing is in crisis and that the state of the field is, is moribund. For him, much contemporary curriculum theorizing has become like a free floating cloud covering a vast territory, always airy, and never touching ground. Curriculum problems and solutions need to be transferred from psychologists, scientists, and mathematicians to curriculum specialists. And these specialists include teachers. So what kind of curriculum thinking do we need? Again, Deng makes the case for us that curriculum studies is not a theoretic field centered on understanding curriculum. It is a practical field with actions of making and doing as ends. And as such, curriculum studies needs to be regarded as a distinctive field of practice in its own right, with its own topics and preoccupations and its own unique ways of theorizing. Furthermore, curriculum thinking needs a kind of boundary crossing that makes possible and thinkable new, new forms of the curriculum including interdisciplinary ones that take account of the realities of schools and classrooms. Indeed, as I argue in a paper with Graham MacPhail, it is attention to the disciplinary boundaries that makes boundary crossing possible, while also avoiding the pedagogic imperative. It must be learner engaged, but it also needs to be teacher led. Rethinking how we theorize the curriculum in order that we can reform practice leads to the questions we can ask about the curriculum. This theorizing requires translation devices that connect theory to practice and, and identify the, con the continuum between pragmatic and principled curriculum making. These devices can be made and applied by teachers. Therefore, curriculum practice entails deliberative decision-making that addresses spe specific issues and problems arising from a need or a desire for, for improvement. Deliberative decision-making requires the use of theory to illumine and interpret those specific issues and problems. Returning to Amanda Spielman's call to schools to be bold and ambitious in making the curriculum, how possible is it for schools to have a curriculum that is non-standard and for teachers to be able to defend their curriculum? Clark reminds us that Rather than indoctrinate student teachers into a passive acceptance of the official status quo of the mandated curriculum, attention must be given to helping them critically to assess the merits of what they're required to implement in the classroom by offering alternative curriculum models. This will only be possible if their study of the individual components of the mandated curriculum is contained within a wider framework of curriculum studies where competing theories, models, approaches, etc., can be rigorously investigated and critiqued. Initial teacher education so, should subject the curriculum to the strongest critical scrutiny possible. This requires re redefining how teachers and learners are viewed as active, autonomous makers of knowledge, and where knowledge is not simply transferred. Here, the professional identity of teachers can include curriculum maker as active participants in creating the curriculum rather than merely reproducing it. By shifting to being recontextualizers, teachers can engage with plans, designs, and the curriculum materials as systems of meaning that they assign to their work, where non-participation is an absence of meaning and a reduction to their work as a performance. And finally, if teachers can resist the pedagogical imperative, they will prevent the loss of meaning of what the curriculum is for and how it can be different. Left unchecked, teaching will continue to drift towards the pragmatic and the instrumental. A bold curriculum, therefore, is a principled one. Thank you.